Drumwise Meets, and today I'm here with Mike Tarana. Hi, Mike. Hi, Tom. How are you? Thanks for having me. First question, uh, the typical first interview question here. So what age did you get into drums? And when you first started playing, what bands or artists inspired you? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I started around the age of eight. And my uncle, my father's brother, my uncle Phil, gave me my first drum set. And I wish I still had it because I realized now it was a vintage classic uh, white marine pearl uh, Slingerland drum set with calfskin heads. It was a bass drum, a snare drum, a rack tom, and a little cymbal. And my uncle brought that over and he put it in the garage and I just sat down and started bashing away and uh, well, the neighbors called the cops and the rest was history. And I kept going, but um, I was inspired primarily by the British invasion. Uh, of course, the, I was a huge Beatles fan and then I remember sitting in the car with my mom and it was in the late sixties and the Led Zeppelin song came on and I heard those drums. I, I always had an ear for the drums. At first I wanted to play guitar. I think most people, when they hear rock music, they want to play guitar. But then I started to focus in on the drums and I thought there's something interesting about this. I don't know what it was. It grabbed my, grabbed my attention. And I remember saying to my mom, this is music from the future. I really, I still think if you go back and listen to any Led Zeppelin record, mm -hmm. there's so much information on there, drumming, guitar, bass, keyboards, vocals. These guys were simply magic. The chemistry of these four individuals was amazing. And of course, as a drummer, John Bonham probably has the ultimate rock swing groove ever, mm -hmm. ever. You can't copy it. I know some guys that come close. My friend Brian Tishy, he's a Bonham fanatic, and he really, he really captures uh, the sound of John Bonham, even the tuning, because I play the Bonzo Bash in Los Angeles during the NAMM show, and we play on these uh, Bonzo kits. He tunes it really good. It's nice. It's really nice. And he plays well. He plays, uh, he studied, he really studied Bonham. A lot of people don't realize that Bonham started a lot of fills with the left hand. Mm -hmm. This is something I never thought about. But anyway, that's for another story. So I started at eight, got into Bonham, got into Ringo, of course, playing Creedence Clearwater Revival. Then I started getting into Kiss. Okay. I love Kiss. I was a member of the Kiss Army in 1976. I was 16. I love the Catman. I still love Kiss. I love their songs. And uh, then I got into another band. My friend got me into this band called Rush. <laughs> Neil Peart, and I saw Rush in 1977. I saw them in a bar on the Caress of Steel tour, which oddly enough, I didn't realize going, watching a documentary on the band, they were gonna break up during that time. They were losing their record deal. Caress of Steel is a very obscure record, and it's the second record that Neil Peart played on. But I saw this man play drums live. It changed my life. I was to completely blown away. The professor, you know, he had the mustache, the robes. <laughs> This guy was from the future as well, freaked me out. So I've always been a drum freak, always staring at the drums, mm. polishing the drums. I bought everybody's drum set in my neighborhood. I made big drum sets. I used to cover them and do everything. So I still do it. I still have a lot of fun. I'm a collector. So I, I think I answered your question. You did. I, Sorry. <laughs> and normally I, I say, oh, you know, what was your first drum kit and stuff? But you've, yeah. you've already answered that. Yeah. So interesting you say about collecting talk to us about you know some of the things you've got in your collection then i got some pretty cool stuff in my storage lockers i've i have about a hundred drum sets Whoa. i never sell my drums all the drums that i play i took on tour i made records my soul is inside those shells that's you know <laughs> if you go back and look at uh, the american indians they got scared when somebody took their picture, like it would capture your soul. I won't sell my drums because I'm afraid someone will have my soul. <laughs> I have Mapex kits, the, the original Mapex kit from the, the Budokan when I played with Yngwie Malmsteen. 
the drum riser and everything. I have the cases, the rope cases. I have uh, a pearl kit. I have two PV drum sets. Remember PV drums? Mm -hmm. yeah. These are collected, very good sounding drums, very strange looking. Uh, there's no hardware on the shelves. I have um, a lot of some vintage drums. I have a lot of premier drums. I was a premier in Dorsey for over 10 years. I have a 75th anniversary premier walnut kit with wood hoops and gold hardware. Beautiful nice. drums. Beautiful. Uh, I have a lot of Signia kits. Mm. I have the Premier Series. I have a couple of D-Drum sets. I have uh, a collector's uh, uh, that I, uh, I bought from uh, when I was living in Germany. It's a Trixon drum set from 1960. Mm. When I lived in Hamburg, Germany, incidentally, Cozy Powell lived in Hamburg, Germany for a while as well, and the Beatles used to play in this area where I lived on the Raper Barn. This is the red light area. Uh, the, the Trixon Drum Company was located on the Raper Barn in this area. And I bought this uh, Rot Glitzer Red Sparkle uh, Trixon drum set. Still has the calfskin heads on it. It's not an egg shaped bass drum. It's a round bass drum, but that was the year I was born. And I thought, okay, I'll buy this as a, as a collector's. It's very hard to tune. Have you ever played on a drum set with calfskin heads? No. I no. It's incredible. When you watch Louis Belson or Buddy Rich yeah. play on these old, or Gene Krupa, these guys were really good to be able to play that fast on calfskin. Because yeah. when the temperature changes, the, they get soft, you know, they get mushy. It's not like a, a, a plastic Mylar drum head. So um, what else do I have? I have a lot of uh, drum craft drum sets. I was involved with a company in Germany called Drumcraft. I have PDP drum sets. Um, I have a couple of custom kits that were just made for me. One of them is a DS. I have it here in my house. It's a, called Drum Sound. Uh, the man that owns the company, his name is Luca. He's working there primarily by himself, building shells, beautiful drums. I have hundreds of snare drums, cymbals, pedals, hardware, lots of stuff. I can't name all the drums. I can't really remember all the stuff I have, but I like to have it with me. Oh, I have a Sonar Designer Series White Sparkle. This is, this is, uh, I, I, I don't want to say, in my opinion, I think it's one of the best drum kits I've ever owned or played. It's the, the Rolls Royce of drum kits or the Mercedes of drum kits. It, this drum set actually won design awards when it was first manufactured. I have the catalog with the vellum in between the pages, all the, uh, I used to be a draftsman, so I'm into like mechanical drawing. All the hardware, the way the, the tom mounts work, and the Signature Series hardware is probably some of the most robust and well thought out hardware ever made. Yeah. Sonar was really making some very, very solid, amazing stuff. Oddly enough, the man that developed a lot of the stuff for Trixon, a lot of his ideas ended up in the Sonar world. He was a brilliant, brilliant uh, engineer. A uh, brilliant inventor. I got a lot of drums. Yeah, yeah that's, that is a lot, definitely. <laughs> you can never have enough drums, never. Can you, can you just say that, say that again, but say, direct it to my wife, say, Becky, Tom can never have enough drums. <laughs> Becky, listen to me, this is Mike Toronto speaking. I'm a professional drummer. Tom can never, and I mean never, have enough drums. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of, actually most of the drum sets I got I have to say I've been very blessed because I have endorsed and I got these as uh, I would say that they are they are gifts. You know, a lot of guys sell off the drum sets they get for free, but I always keep them. So I'm very fortunate to have them. And when I was a kid, I remember my parents would say, OK, what do you want for Christmas? Drums. I never got drums. They didn't want me to be a drummer. So now I got drums. My house is full of drums, awesome. full of drums. <laughs> That's because I'm not married. <laughs> yeah, They're <that's> everywhere. <laughs> my drums aren't allowed out of my studio. They're not allowed in the house. <laughs> You're in your man cave. That's your man cave. Enjoy it. Exactly. Now, um, I believe that we evolve as drummers um, and we take on different influences as we grow. But that said, here's a question for you. If you had to name just one, who would be your all-time favorite drummer? Okay, I think 
every drummer would say the same thing. Rock drummer, John Bonham. It's gonna be. John Bonham. John Bonham is, is pure magic. There's, I know his son, I know Jason a little bit, and he's a really cool guy. It was nice to speak with him. And uh, even Jason plays like his father, but still, what this man had, I don't know. Some kind of magic. And you have to remember, too, that these records were recorded on tape, live, one take, with a couple of microphones, no tricks, no Pro Tools. Yeah. No quantizing. That's the man and the sticks. And that's something we don't have anymore today. So that's why I respect John Bonham. Of course, I think probably, technically speaking, one of the greatest drummers that ever walked the face of the earth is Buddy Rich. Hmm. Yeah. This guy's uh, not from this planet. Yeah, totally. And, and that's, yeah. that's why I say it's a really hard question because it, it's, Very hard. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many people that we take on as influences, aren't they? So yes. um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mean question, but I like to throw it at people. So uh, a good one. And uh, another one which some people have found hard to answer. What's been the highlight of your career so far? Right now, Tom, talking to you, this has been the, actually talking to you right now has been the highlight of 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a year. Um, no, the highlight of my career, okay, I would have to say, uh, you know, uh, about, I think, five or six years ago, there's a festival in the Czech Republic called the Masters of Rock. Mm -hmm. And I was invited there to break a world record in the Czechoslovakian book of world records to play with the most bands in one day. Wow. So I played four shows, the last show being my own solo show in front of about 30,000 people. I did a record of all classical music called Symphonica and that was, I, I played with a bunch of bands from uh, European rock bands, recording acts. And then I came out and I played, it was dark. I was alone on stage with my drums, my drum craft kit, with white drum set with copper. Hardware like Keith Moon had. I love, love Keith Moon. Another great guy. There's another one. Now. <laughs> another one. It's, a lot of guys came out of England. Let me tell you, a lot of great drummers. But um, Ginger Baker, can't forget about that guy. Uh, I, I was on stage playing the classical music alone, and then at the end, uh, they they came out and they gave me a war an award for doing that and. I think for me, that was like the pinnacle of, okay, I'm actually doing this. I'm, I'm able to stand alone on stage, um, playing some beautiful music. I didn't write the music. It's classical music, of course, but my interpretation of it. And so, yeah, I think that was a highlight, a good memory over the past 40 something years. Kind of a, going down the educational route for this question. So, yeah. When you first get a gig with a new artist, you know, whether it be recording or, or going, you know, learning stuff to play live, how do you learn the songs? So do you just listen? Do you listen and, you know, transcribe it? Or uh, are you given a, a whole folder and they say, here you go, Mike, here's the entire show written out in drum music for you? <laughs> Thank God they don't do that. Um, I, I can read. I'm not a sight reader like Vinnie Cagliuto or one of these guys that sit down and Jeff Picaro, they can read a chart like nothing. Uh, however, I did study, take some lessons when I was younger and I learned how to write my own fills and I've created my own system for making charts. And I found that when I got more busy, when I was younger, someone would give me the record, you sit at home and listen to it and then you play and you make a lot of mistakes. Finally, you remember everything. but. I found that when I was able to chart out and write out certain figures that were problematic or difficult to remember, when you see it and you write it, that's a good way to learn, right? Learning by rote. You, you see it, you write it, and then when you take the paper away, it's important to get to a point where you take the paper away and then play the song. You actually see the bars going by. Mm. I never thought that would happen for me, but. It's kind of like learning a foreign language. I, I lived in Germany, so I, I speak some German. It's not good German, but it got to the point where I was actually thinking in German, mm. which is strange for a guy who grew up speaking English. 
You know, you start to think in German. It's the same thing when you start to write out your parts and you, you make a chart. It doesn't have to be every note, but you see the verses, the bridge, you see the amount, especially if it's odd meter or something. And if it's a crazy fill, you see it. Even in the mind's eye, you will still see it. So I think learning to read and write music is a very important tool. I wish I would have spent more time on that when I was younger. But like I said, my parents didn't want me to go to school for music. They thought it was a waste of time and money. But instead, your career path has taken you here to this moment talking to me. So there you are. <laughs> I love it, Tom. I really like you. <laughs> Let's keep going back to that. Um, <laughs> off camera at the beginning of the interview, we talked a bit about, uh, you know, what I do and, and my show being um, a Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin tribute. Um, mm -hmm. And we got talking about Cozy Powell. So... Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your link with, with you know, stuff that you've done Cozy Power mm -hmm. related? Okay, well, he was a big influence on my drumming. I mean, when I was growing up in the 70s, 1976, somehow I obtained an album called Rainbow Rising. Ronnie James Dio on vocals. And on the back, I saw this guy playing this awesome Ludwig Sparkle drum kit. I was like, who is this guy? So I start listening and I hear Stargazer and, you know, all the great, other great songs on that record. And um, I started to hear the open tuning of the drums and I thought, this guy is kind of like a mixture because Tommy Aldridge was also one of my idols. For, for me, it was like Tommy Aldridge and Cozy Powell, they were kind of like similar with the double bass style on different sides of the pond. You know what I mean? Uh, Tommy has a more an American style and then Cozy has this laid back bluesy style, which a lot of British drummers have, but which I, which I really prefer. Um, but I heard the open tuning in Cozy's playing and I thought, ah, this guy's like uh, an offshoot of John Bonham with double bass. And I know they were friends. And I thought the band was so cool. And I started learning to play more double bass. I was very influenced by the work of Cozy Powell with his work with Gary Moore, White Snake. Uh, I know I had a couple of his solo albums because he was playing kind of fusion style music. And I thought that was cool. And then I saw his drum solo when he played the 1812 Overture. That completely blew me away because I never saw a rock or heavy metal drummer play along to classical music. This is what started my project called Symphonica. That was the start of it. I actually wanted to do a tribute to Cozy because uh, he unfortunately lost his life in a tragic way, which is a very big loss for the drumming community, music community. Um, really, it was kind of quiet. No one did too much stuff for him. So I wanted to do the, a remake of the 1812 Overture. I played it in my own way. I tried to take some little pieces of what Cozy did out of respect for what he did with the song. But that was a, he was a very big influence on me. Fast forward to, I don't know, 2005, 2006, seven. I meet a guy, a gentleman by the name of Bob Richards, a British gentleman, good guy. He owns Cozy Powell's drum set from the Slide It In White Snake Tour, the Chrome Yamaha drum set. And, um, it was, I think this was maybe three or four years ago. They had the Cozy Powell plaque unveiling in his hometown of Sirencester. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went there. No one invited me. I went there with my own money, a pilgrimage, if you will, to respect Cozy Powell, just to be there. Mm -hmm. And I spent some time in Sirencester. I drank in some of the pubs around there. Hey. Brian May was there, Tony Iommi. Neil Murray played with... Um, Cozy, they were a team, bass and drum team for many years. Neil is a great guy, a sweet guy, uh, excellent player. And they played together with uh, Gary Moore, I think uh, also in Black Sabbath. Again, we, uh, that's where I first became uh, known to Bob Richards, the owner of the Cozy Powell drum set. Uh, Bob is a drummer himself as well. And then he decided to put together the Cozy Powell birthday bash, which happens uh, around Christmas time, I think Cozy was born on the 24th of December, 24th, 25th. So uh, we all get together and play. We play rainbow songs, uh, Black Sabbath songs, mm -hmm. White Snake songs, a lot of, a lot of drummers. Uh, 
great drummers from there. It's interesting you said about the plaque because I remember um, with uh, Purple Zeppelin when we played, it must have been near there, we play, mm -hmm. spoiler alert, we play Since You've Been Gone as part of the show. Um, mm -hmm. And a lady came up to me after the show and she said, oh, I arranged for the plaque for Cozy Pal. I, I the blue plaque. Off. Yeah, I arranged for that. And she said, mm -hmm. you guys playing that, oh, it was brilliant. And he'd be so impressed and just thank you for playing. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's so nice. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah it's nice to hear that. And, and actually, if you, if you go to this event, you will see people or meet people that were neighbors of Cozy. And they come up and tell you little stories about him. They have pictures of his house. So for me, being 60 years old now and going back, this, it, things have kind of come full circle for me. And I was playing Stargazer, which for me was one of the most impressive songs I heard when I was 16. So how is he playing that? Now I'm playing it on his drums. I have video that I can put, include the video. Mm -hmm. uh, and my feet are on these actual old premier pedals that he used to use. And it's a very big spread out drum set, two 26 inch bass drums. They're wide open, there's nothing inside them. Mm. Wow. Two 16 inch toms, they're really, and the cymbals are all on the side. So it's quite challenging to play Mr. Powell's drums. And uh, of course it's an honor and a kind of a spiritual event for me. I'm, I'm always nervous when I do it. Of course you want to play the best you can, everybody does. Uh, but yeah, you play on that drum set and you can't move anything. You play it as is. So it's, Cool. You said, uh, you know, a spiritual event. It, just going back to what you said earlier about your yeah. drum sets, you know, like yeah. you've recorded on that drum set and your, like, your spirit, your ether is in, in the drums. So when you're playing on cozies, you know, it's yeah. the same deal. It's there. And I'll tell you what, if you hit them the right way, you will sound like cozy. Yeah. It's in the drums. Yeah. Really. When yeah. I play the intro to Stargazer, Okay, maybe I play with a, a bit of a different feel. I think on the video it's maybe a bit faster because you're amped up, but sound is there. The sound is there. Oh, wow. That's so cool. It's pretty crazy. And um, also I played with his drumsticks as well. He played with really fat drumsticks, mm. really heavy, very thick drumsticks. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I did the 1812 Overture actually with a pair of his sticks. That was quite challenging on my drums. But wow. They were actually... The sticks that he played with he put tape on them and stuff but can't say enough great things about cozy powell i mean even if this guy didn't play drums he'd still be cool he looked cool yeah i have a lot of respect for cozy powell i really love him man. absolutely amazing yes so my next question uh have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you had to recover from Never, Tom. I never make any mistakes. I'm one of the best people that ever walked the face of this planet. Okay, next question. <laughs> oh, man, so many. <laughs> What's the saying? If something can go wrong, it normally will go wrong, and especially when you play in a rock band. There's all kinds of crazy, crazy things. I just remembered one thing when I was playing in a cover band back in Western New York. I remember I was playing, you know, having a good time, and the guys were looking at me, and they were like, hey, man, hey. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. The lights were coming down, the whole, and I, I felt the heat, and then I stood up, and I held the lighting rig until the road crew came. I held it with my muscles. Nice. Got to be strong to be a drummer, but, oh, God, there's so many things that can happen before, during, and after a show. I've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, okay, probably not. A, I can't tell you stories on the same level of Keith Richards, but I can, I can tell you a lot of crazy things that have happened. Uh, sometimes, this is not so nice. I was thinking about it this morning, actually. When you get food poisoning on tour, because you're playing in a lot of strange places, mm -hmm. anybody who's had food poisoning knows what can happen. Stuff is coming out of you. <laughs> without and you can't control it on both ends you know what i'm saying yep. and you can't say you know what i don't feel good i'm just going to stay in my room no no you're going to do the show if it's not the singer <laughs> you're going to do the show and i've made i did many shows with uh heavy food poisoning mm -hmm. this is a nightmare 
<laughs> because when you play, I play in a lot of bands that play a lot of double bass, you know? So you can imagine if you have food poisoning and you're, you're having an upset stomach, someone says, okay, now I want you to run for 90 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Drumming is physical, you know? Any big equipment fails or anything? Because, you know, obviously you've got, you've got quite a big drum set. Yeah, I mean, I think the worst thing that can happen is when the bass drum head breaks. Mm -hmm. This really is a nightmare because the way my drum set is constructed, a lot of guys, I don't put anything on the bass drum. It might resonate freely. You know, we live in a world today where everything is shock mounted and rim mounted, but who had the best drum sound ever? John Bonham? The mounts went right into the drums, right? So. I put everything on my bass drum. You can't lift my bass drum because there's cymbal stands on it and toms. And I like it because then the bass drums don't move. Mm. The problem is when you break a drum head, you start playing, I start playing the other bass drum and the roadie's trying to change the main, the main bass drum head. And uh, it's not easy. No, no, that's, yeah, that's not all that stuff on there. So that's probably, the, that's a showstopper. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I, I remember I did a tour in Japan in 2013. I flew out there and it was the first show and it was on my birthday. And we were knackered yeah. after the flight. But two songs in, house kit, house kit. Yeah. Right. I, I, I have sure found yeah, in, in Japan when I was watching a lot of the drums, they all do play quite lightly, a lot of the guys. So I get on with my heavy right foot. And I'm like, uh -huh. okay, that's broken. Yeah, and then uh -huh. <laughs> um, two songs in. Luckily, spare drum head, all good. But yeah, not as good. good. You had somebody. Who, yeah, when the bass drum goes, it goes. I remember one time I was playing with Tony McAlpine in San Francisco, and we were driving in a van. And then when you're driving six hours every night in between shows, mm -hmm. I remember I got there, I put my drums together. We didn't have the money to have a road crew. And I back then I had headphones. We were playing to a click track, right? And the click was in the left, always in the left ear. And I kept the other ear off. But I was so tired that I had the headphones on the other way. And I hit the, we had a DAT machine, a big machine. I used to play the playback and I hit the DAT and the, the intro's going. And I hear, I hear the click, but I'm, I'm like, I'm hearing it. So, and, I, and I'm yelling at Tony, I can't hear, I can't hear the click. And that's because, I, the click was going into my skull, <laughs> so I did hear it. And then I realized halfway through and I had to turn the headphones around. <laughs> Great way to start the show. But these things happen. Yep, totally. Especially, especially when you're sleep deprived and you're flying and you're playing rental drums, not your own drums, and you're changing time zones. A lot of people don't realize what that's like. When you fly to Japan, it's a 12 hour flight and you might land, and the next day you're doing a show. You're you're sleepy. Really, you're, you're you know it's three o'clock in the morning where you live, and it's like all right, we have to rock. It's like huh. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a lot of crazy things that can happen, hmm. but uh, most of it's funny. Yeah, well that's it. You gotta laugh, <laughs> even if it's not funny when it's happening. Exactly, you can funny laugh. later. Yeah. <laughs> now, um. What are your hobbies away from drums? Well, I have to tell you that my, my main hobby is drumming. So like everything I do, anything else I do normally goes to the drumming. Like I like to, I was training a lot in the gym. I, I think it's important to stay in shape also just for my personal health, not to be a tough guy, not to run around and grab people, but just to, you know, feel fit and to be able to, because when you play drums, you know, it's a physical instrument. You have to have uh, a lot of endurance, especially when you're playing uh, this higher level double bass metal stuff. So uh, I'm doing a lot of training um, and really drumming is my hobby. Mm. However, as I've gotten older, I've found a few things to uh, kind of that make me happy that also kind of help drumming. I'm, I'm a cyclist. I like to ride my bicycle. I like Tommy Aldridge. He's always riding his bicycle. Uh, I think it's a great way to stay in shape and it's a great way to get fresh air. Now I'm not training in the gym because the gyms are closed. And I discovered 
uh, this, the world of calisthenics. And I actually think it's harder than training in the gym. I think it's better for your muscles. I'm not so tight. And you're training with your own body weight. So I actually, I feel better and I'm drumming better at the age of 60 doing calisthenics, just push-ups and pull-ups. Um, I think it's a nice way to train. And again, you're outside. Mm. So normally as drummers, we're always in some practice room. Mm. Also, uh, some of my other hobbies, I like, uh, for some reason, I don't know, maybe because I'm a drummer, I enjoy time. So I, I like to collect uh, time pieces. I like watches. Mm. I watch a lot of documentaries on how they make watches. It's extremely fascinating. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I, years ago in 1981, I graduated from college with a degree in electrical engineering. So I have a, an engineering background and I enjoy little machines, uh, some technology. You know, I, I wasn't a great student, uh, but I, I did it because again, my, my parents told me, you have to have something else to fall back on. You just don't want to be a rock star. <laughs> So uh, I enjoy uh, reading. I like to read a lot. I read a lot of books. Now we have the e-reader. You can download it. You can carry, you know, you can have 10 books in a, mm. in this little box, you know, before we had to carry all these books around. Yeah. So when you're traveling, you can't, you travel light. So reading is cool. Actually, I used to be a big fan of listening to music, but I make so much music and I'm playing drums so much that uh, I don't listen to music anymore. Mm. I used to. Um, I find now that I prefer silence. Yeah, I, I'm the same. <laughs> yeah, I prefer silence. I like talking also, I enjoy talking, but only to certain people. <laughs> yeah, because a lot, of, a lot of people just want to talk about nothing. I mean, someone might come up to me and I start talking about drums and they're like, later, this guy's boring. So I like to talk to people with my interests, not just anybody. Mm. So I've become more selective as I've gotten older. Not that I'm antisocial. Yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> but I also, I also enjoy talking to people that are uh, way more intelligent than me. Uh, I have a lot of friends here. None of them are musicians. They're doctors. Uh, they have a different lifestyle, a different way of looking at things. So I think that kind of rounds me out, you know, because when you're in a rock band, it's like a traveling circus. You have all kinds of creatures. I'm also one of the creatures. I'm crazy. You have to be crazy to do this. So, but when I come home and I'm hanging out with some people, I like to hang out with somebody from a different walk of life, so to speak. Tell us about your latest project. Well, as you all know, there's a difficult situation facing everybody right now uh, with COVID-19. This pandemic has basically paralyzed the world, closed the world, closed a lot of events. And uh, I made this video uh, to kind of shed light on the uh, situation facing musicians right now during this uh, difficult times, the COVID-19 situation. What I did was I, uh, I took self-isolation, self-distancing to the extremes. And I went to the island of Sardinia and I worked with a group of people over there uh, that were very kind, artists, uh, videographers, um, and uh, organizers, event organizers. And I filmed myself playing drums all over this island in various beautiful, remote, and desolate locations. Sardinia is a very wild island, so uh, you can see this in the video. Uh, and I, my original intention was to go there and shoot a video for my new single, for my solo project. And this song is called uh, Deep in the Heart of Me. I'm singing and playing drums. This is also something new for me. But first and foremost, uh, we decided to do something for musicians and uh, to, the, the point of the video is to let a lot of musicians know, stay cool, keep creative, keep playing, keep making music because the music can't die even now. This will end, I think, I hope in the near future and we can all go back to work and make music and do the shows. But I think it's important now, whether you're an amateur or professional, keep practicing, keep learning, keep creating. It keeps your mind focused and uh, this will pass. That's the point of it. So, and uh, you can, anybody can check that out on Instagram, YouTube, 
Facebook, I won't stop the music. Uh, the, the, the thing is, you know, there's a lot of people on Facebook, social media, whatever, they're complaining. And I also, I'm not so happy about this, but the thing is when you keep complaining, you're just reinforcing this negative energy. You have to stay, stay straight, you know, stay cool. The complaining doesn't help the situation. Go into your practice room, learn something, get better, wait for the, for times to change. I'm 60 years old. I've been through a lot of ups and downs, you know, it's just another curveball that life has thrown everybody. We'll get over it. I think so. Talking about curveballs, that, that leads me perfectly <laughs> to my curveball question. So, okay. Mike, what's your favorite biscuit slash cookie? Oh, God. You know what? <laughs> That's kind of one of my hobbies. I love cookies. I don't know why. I've been drinking coffee since I was like six or seven years old, and I like to dip my cookies in the coffee. Chocolate chip. I can eat chocolate chip cookies all day, especially if they're freshly baked. But uh, currently I'm eating a lot of these uh, cereal cookies, you know, mm -hmm. and those are good in the coffee and they're healthy. Yeah. So it's kind of like a lot of people eat a breakfast bar, like a granola breakfast bar. I eat these kind of here in uh, Italy, they're called digestive cookies. So they won't make you so fat. I'm sure there's some sugar in there, but I don't care. I mean, you know what, sometimes, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of crazy things that go on in life and there's nothing better than a cup of coffee and a couple of good cookies just to kind of even things out. <laughs> I take a break. I take a break from practicing. If I'm recording something, I'm getting crazy. I say, you know what? I think I'll have a cup of coffee and a few cookies. Everybody thinks I'm a tough guy, you know? I'm not a tough guy. I'm at home eating cookies. I love cookies. <laughs> and I imagine in Italy, you know, you're, you've got, a, a vast selection of coffee and you know cookies and cookies. pastries and all, all that to choose from yeah for sure i mean it's uh also i mean here in italy you can order a croissant filled with nutella yeah <laughs> this is this will get you going mm. you know a cappuccino and a croissant filled with nutella i don't eat nutella anymore mm. When I first moved to Europe, we didn't have this stuff in America. And I remember about 22 years ago, I was living in Holland and I started eating Nutella on bread. And one day I looked down and uh, I couldn't see so much of my sneakers. <laughs> I was just getting a belly and I was like, oh man, I have to stop. And I haven't eaten it since. Just once in a while on a, on a, on a croissant. But the Nutella is uh, powerful stuff. On to my final and uh, serious question. So if you could give just one bit of advice to people starting out playing the drums, what would that be? First of all, you have to be realistic. I think when you start with anything, you have to be realistic about what you're about to do. And you have to be serious, obviously. And you have to be aware of the fact that being a professional drummer really isn't a job. It's not a real job. A lot of people now we had MTV and you have YouTube and it's, it's kind of put out there like, Oh, this, this is my job. Being in the arts is, will never be a real job. You know, you're self-employed. You have to pay for your own insurance. They don't tell you about these things, but your own health insurance, when there's no work, there's no unemployment checks unless you're paying into that. So you have to take care of all these other things that normally uh, uh, a, a self-employed person wouldn't do if you're working a regular job. You're self-employed, okay? So I think one of the most important things is you have to have a good sense of business because the music business, even though it's very difficult to make money, you have music, art, and you have business. Business is a different part of the brain. I would recommend young people to read a book written by Gene Simmons, the bass player for KISS. It's called Me Incorporated. And it's not just a book about the music business. It's a book about an entrepreneurial lifestyle, another uh, someone who is creative and wants to work for themselves. And um, I wish I would have had that book when I was 21 years old. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot of things the hard way. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes. You're gonna fall, get up, dust yourself off and keep going. 
But the music business is a tricky business. Uh, there's a lot of people that will try to steal, a lot of people that will lie. <laughs> and of course, you want to believe them. They tell you what you want to hear. Now the business has changed a lot. There's really no more record companies. So maybe you're looking at being a drum instructor or a YouTube guy, and you're going to try to make money monetizing your, your uh, content. There's different ways to approach it. It was much different when I was younger. I used to go out in the bars and play five, six nights a week, cover band, whatever, making money, then touring. The way I live now, I live from touring. Music is essentially free. So be prepared for the challenge, be realistic. And if you really believe in your heart and soul that you're a drummer or that you're gonna be a, a musician or a self-employed person, make sure you commit to it and don't listen to the doubters. Don't listen to the naysayers. There'll be a lot of negative energy around you. Ignore them, push them out. I've read a lot of books on positive thinking. And one of the other books that I read that really helped me was called The Magic of Believing by Claude M. Bristol. And you can listen to the book now as an audio book on YouTube. This book was written in the 30s. And all the information in this book still applies. And I've read this book maybe about five or six times to reiterate the positive thoughts. But most, po most books about positive thinking have the same common thread. You know, don't watch the news. Worry about things that only you can change. You know, if you turn on the news and they just dump all this stuff on you, it's like, Oh, gee, I'm tired. I don't even want to practice. Exclude it. You can only worry about worry about what's in your sphere, what you can actually manage and change. That's the problem. A lot of people get overwhelmed, you know, and a lot of people, I've had a lot of people tell me, you're horrible. You're never going to make it. Mike, you're a dreamer. Let me tell you something. It's the people that have dreams and it's the people that are a little bit outside the normal those are the people that change things. Those are the game changers. Not the people that get on the treadmill and go to work every day. Not, not that the, there's something wrong with that, but there's just something to be said for people that are creative that take chances in life. Mm. Yeah. Look at a guy like Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. He's a strange guy, but he's doing a lot of cool things, okay? A lot of people don't agree with him. He's not a musician, but he is an artist in some way. So. I think it's the people that take chances in life, that believe in themselves and go against the grain. Those are the people that make a difference. And maybe you will be one of those people. Maybe you'll change music. Maybe you'll change the business. Who knows? There's always another way of thinking and creating. And it's funny you should say that. And I, I, I love what you said there. And, you know, if I could go back and tell a 18 year old Tom, you know, to mm -hmm. be more confident and to take more chances, then I absolutely would. Because back then, you know, off camera, I mean, I, I probably wasn't 18 in the picture, but off camera, I showed mm -hmm. you a picture of me meeting you back in uh, 2008. And mm -hmm. back then for me to, to have said to you, oh, sorry, can I have a picture or whatever? You know, that would have been a, a quite a big deal. Whereas nowadays, you know, I, I've, this is how I've come to meet you again on here and stuff, just by taking a chance and messaging everybody. What's the worst that can happen, you know? And I think that's a good yeah. thing to, to live by, isn't it? Um, the whole Dr. Pepper tagline, what's the worst that could happen? Um, True. I mean, the, the thing is, you have to have some kind of inner confidence. There's a difference between having confidence and being an arrogant bastard. Mm. <laughs> that doesn't work. The arrogance, people see through that very quickly. But if you're confident and you're polite and well-mannered, you will go somewhere. The other thing is, believing in yourself, I remember when I was younger, I was naive, of course just as naive as you were when you showed me that picture. I was green, as we say. And that naivete actually is an advantage sometimes because you're going into something that's really difficult without really knowing how difficult it is, okay? And between the self-confidence and being naive, you'll be able to ride, and actually being young, you'll be able to ride that roller coaster. But I remember when I was younger, 16, 17, I was afraid to tell people what I actually wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to be a drummer, but when I told people, they laughed at me. Mm. I mean, I come from Buffalo, New York. There's no rock stars. Mm. If you're a drummer, you play in a wedding band, you know, 
you make money on the weekends in a wedding band. So uh, this was a kind of a lifestyle and a vocation that uh, was bizarre to most people in my in my sphere. And I remember my father yelling at me constantly, you cannot make your hobby your vocation over and over and over again. And I was like, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And what was it that Benjamin Franklin said? Find something that you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. So obviously we have to make money. If you're going into the music business solely with the, the idea of I'm gonna get rich easy and make a lot of money, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. But if your passion is music and drumming and creativity, then you're in the right spot. The money will come and you will work hard. But while you're working hard, you won't realize it because as we used to say in America, half the fun is getting there. Okay. I often look back on things that happened to me when I was 18, 20, 21. They were funny, big mistakes, but actually, you know what? I was happy. Mm. I was happy. I remember being in Los Angeles when I first moved there. I was broke. I was broke as hell. I was eating once a day. I was happy. I was in the right place. I said, okay, now I could, maybe something will happen. You know? So, but also because of the people that were around me in my past talking negatively, for some reason, when I was playing, there was always that little voice in the back. I think you're doing something wrong. Mm. You have to push that out. Mm. You have to push that out. But this, this is what you will learn from the positive thinking books. I think this is important for young people. Um, these things, these negative things, they are learned. You are not born with fear, fear of the unknown. That is put into you from the television, the movies, your parents, your friends. That fear is put into you and you have to push it out. Yeah. Wasn't it Winston Churchill said that we only, uh, the only thing to fear is fear itself? Yeah. There he are. was quite a wise man. He was a Brit. So, I mean, really it's true. And you will learn this if you read a couple of positive thinking books. You will learn that when you're born, you're born with the innate fear of loud noise and fire. You know, something that hurts you. That's it. The rest is all put in. Yeah. from whatever is around you. So, I mean, you can take two different people. You can put one up, one child in a negative environment and one kid in a positive environment. Chances are the kid in the positive environment will, will be okay. Mm. Yeah. You're really a product of your environment and your inner thoughts. That's why you must be strong and focused. That's such good advice. Nice one. Thank you. I'm old. <laughs> I learned, actually, I learned a lot. I, I'm glad that I'm able to give some information to young people, you know? And the other thing about practicing, a lot of guys are like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to practice for six hours. And maybe five of those hours you're thinking about something. If you do one hour of good focused practice, you did it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I practice for five hours, but I'm really working on different things. So that's all I'll say about practice, positive thinking, and being realistic and being business oriented. Mike, thank you so much for spending your time with us here at Drumwise today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me, I enjoyed it.